I would like to I would like to talk today about a different uh, different regime of uh, training in neural networks, namely about unsupervised training and generative models. So, of course, we hinted a little bit about this kind of setting from the beginning of, of, of this course, but let's see some, some details today. So basically, until now, we have been talking about the following training model. We have, we have some, some instance space x. We had some label space y. And again, in our, in our context, label might be some discrete, uh, uh, some discrete set of labels as in classification problem, or maybe some continuous uh, set of values as in regression problem. So we'll, we are calling them labels in both cases. And basically, we were interested in finding maps between x and y, uh, given some samples of training pairs in the form of instance xi and corresponding label yi. And basically, based on this fine example, we would like to, uh, to extrapolate well, to extrapolate the uh, to extrapolate the underlying map. Okay, we will see that basically this problem is, is actually solvable if we make certain assumptions. Like that, that, that was the basis of uh, supervised learning that we discussed, and then we. Uh, discussed, we actually spent quite a bit of time on actually constructing certain hypothesis <coughs> classes that are able, uh, are able to uh, realize such maps in the form of the neural network. So today I would like to talk about the case in which we don't have this. So we might have some label, we might have some label space, I'm not saying that it is not necessarily uh, undefined, but we simply don't have access to labels. So our training data are only given uh, in the form of examples of instances. And this setting is called unsupervised training. So basically, we don't have this supervision signal telling us which label to produce. So then you might, might, ask, uh, uh, might, might ask yourselves, what exactly are we going to learn? So we are not learning a map between X and Y anymore. We, we don't care about Y anymore. Basically, we would like, to, we would like somehow to model how the data uh, how the data are structured in the instance in the instance space. Basically, we would like to build some data model. We don't exactly know, for example, if we have images that we are classifying to a certain uh, uh, set of classes. We don't really know how exactly to classify them because for that we would need the labels. But still, we would like somehow to model how exactly the data of natural images are structured in our data space. Okay, so this is the purpose of uh, this is the purpose of. Uh, unsupervised learning, and basically one of the one of the goals would be to construct such a model that will generate new data. So imagine a black box, we hit a button, and we produce something that looks like a new instance that we have never observed before. So that, that would be a generative model. We would like to be able to generate new instances, to generate new data. And so basically, I guess this idea of creating data models, we, we would like some way to some way to. Uh, to capture the structure of our instance space. And there is a very powerful idea or powerful heuristic that, uh, that we as humans have been using probably since the beginning of the civilization. And it was formalized probably in the most famous form by, by William of Ockham, who was a, a Franciscan uh, friar in England. And he, he basically he claimed that if you are presented with two hypotheses uh, explaining the same thing, then select the one that makes the smallest number of assumptions. This is known in philosophy as Ockham Razor. Basically, it, it promotes the idea of parsimony. So if you can explain something in a simpler way, take that as the most plausible explanation. And in, in particular, when we, uh, when we apply this principle to data, basically we, uh, we make the assertion that uh, the data can be described by a small number of degrees of freedom. And we actually encounter many times in real data that this is indeed the case. For example, if you take uh, a 256 by 256 image, let's say quantized to 8 bits, uh, this space of uh, 60, uh, six, 65 and something thousand uh, pixels, each having 256 possi possible values, gives rise to something like 10 to the power of one, uh, 150,000 different possibilities. It's a 
huge astronomical number, much bigger than the number of particles in the universe. But you, you, you will certainly agree with me that only a tiny fraction of these possible combinations actually look like an initial image. Most of them look just, will just look like, like random noise. Okay? So basically, uh, among this humongous amount of possibilities that we can fill this space, uh, just a tiny fraction, just a small number of possibilities are actually valid, are actually describing the data. It means that somehow we can capture our data with a much smaller number of degrees of freedom than these uh, 65,000 dimensions. Okay? And it, when more mathematically, depending on your, your point of view, you can say that there is some uh, embedding space having 65,000 dimensions. And within this uh, embedding space, which is a very high dimensional space, and this is a, a small image for, for modern standards, within this high dimensional space lies some low dimensional manifold to which the data belong. So the data form really as a low dimensional, intrinsic and low dimensional structure, geometric structure in this embedding space. So the embedding dimension is high, the intrinsic dimension is relatively low. Or if you prefer the probabilistic view, we can say that the data come from some distribution which is at least approximately supported on uh, a low dimensional manifold in this space. Okay? And it, uh, I'm, I'm insisting on, on the term manifold because, well, this structure is usually something, something non-linear, non something non-Euclidean, and uh, uh, basically we need somehow to model it. So basically, the purpose of uh, unsupervised learning or for the construction of generic models in, in this setting would simply boil down to discover to the discovery of the manifold for this uh, uh, distribution from which the data are coming, from examples of data. Okay, so now, set in, this, in, the, in these terms, I think it is much easier to see what exactly could be the utility and the purpose of unsupervised learning. Okay? So basically what we are going to do, we are going to try to do what is called dimensionality reduction. Right? We would like to take some data embedded in a high dimensional space and distill, discover just those degrees of freedom that describe the data as fully as possible. Okay. And of course, we are all aware of different dimensionality reduction techniques, like PCA, for example. PCA is a linear dimensionality reduction technique, and, and being a linear technique, of course, it is very limited because typically data have very intricate nonlinear structures. Okay. So basically, we would like to discover all those intricate nonlinear structures by using our powerful tools that we already uh, uh, we already know. Basically, we would like to use nonlinear multilayer uh, neural networks. Uh, to do dimensionality reduction. Okay. So basically, deep learning offers a very, a very interesting tool for this purpose, which is called an autoencoder. So imagine we have some data space X, and I will draw the same data space, uh, space X again, but essentially it's the same space. Okay. So I would like to do some map from X to X. What I'm going to do, I'm going to, I'm going to construct something here. Let's call this map. This will be a map. Uh, let's call it phi. Parameter parameterized by some parameter alpha. Okay, that will map our data into some intermediate space. Let's call it z. Okay. So we take a data point and we map it to some point z. Okay. This, of course, is, is our instance instance space, and this will be called what well, is usually referred to as a latent space. Okay. So basically, we are going to take an instance and encode it using a vector in this latent representation space. So let's call this part an encoder. Okay. And what we are going to do next, we are going to put another nonlinear map here. Essentially, this map is a neural network, of course, right? With some set of parameters alpha. We are going to put another map here. Let's call it psi beta. So this map was from x to z. This map is from z to x. Uh, and we'll call it a decoder, or a generator. That will take z and map it back to x. Okay. 
So ideally, we would like this representation to be more or less a tautology. We take an encoder, we compose it with a decoder, and we would like this to be an identity map. Okay, so we would like the data to pass through as if nothing happened. So you can ask why why do we care about the building an identity map? But pay attention that we have some intermediate representation space here, and suppose now this is very high dimensional space. Suppose here we really squeeze it to some low dimension. <coughs> this is you can see graphically it looks like a bottleneck. So we, it is really <coughs> called a bottleneck. So we we are we are demanding in this identity map we are demanding some very low dimensional uh, representation to be created in the middle of this encoder decoder pair. Okay. So if the dimension of this space is lower than the dimension of the embedding space, no trivial identity maps are possible here. So imagine that uh, I frequently do it in, uh, in, in exams. So I'm not allowing you to bring your, your material to the exam, but you can bring an A4 uh, uh, page and fill it with whatever you like. Okay, so you really want to distill your knowledge about this, about this course into this one page of, uh, into this one page of written text. Okay, so what exactly are you going to write? So you want to write something that captures in the most faithful and more complete, most complete way the amount of data that uh, resides in the, in the, in the instant state. Right? So basically you would like to compress somehow to discover all those latent and potentially very complicated degrees of freedom that describe the data as fully as possible. Of course, these maps might, might be very complicated. Okay? So if the dimension here more or less matches the, the true number of degrees of freedom and your, your maps are sufficiently, sufficiently, have, have sufficiently high capacity, then you will be able to create a very good representation. In, good in the sense that you would like to be, uh, we would like it to be as close to the identity map as possible. Okay? So the way we train this system, obviously, we, we would like <coughs> to give it <coughs> training samples and minimize some distance. Let's say the L2 distance, but the distance itself will be crucial in practice. Let's say we minimize minimize it over the parameter of alpha and beta. So we train a pair of encoder and decoder in such a way that it is approximately uh, well, of course there is some some over right here, uh, that it, it gives approximately uh, an identity. Okay. <coughs> Any questions so far? So this this kind of an architecture that comprises an encoder and decoder with an intermediate bottleneck, uh, creating this latent representation, is called an autoencoder. We are encoding the data uh, and then decoding it to itself. Okay. So this training really looks like a regression program, right? But we are not regressing some label space Y. We're actually re regressing data from itself. Okay? And by the way, even if the dimension here is very big, still the particular architecture of the encoder and the decoder networks can create something useful. Okay? So, the, the, so basically this is this is the main idea of uh, of an autoencoder. Let's see how to implement how to implement it using uh, real uh, neural network. So let's see what is very popular in the form of, an, uh, of a convolutional autoencoder. Basically, uh, the output will be also shifting by. Okay. 
So in practice, what we are doing, what we are doing, we are doing uh, typically what is called strided convolution. So it's convolution and subsampling of the output. Sometimes instead of subsampling, we will use pooling, which is a non-shift invariant approach. Okay. So let's let's imagine that we are using a CNN, a convolutional neural network, as our encoder. So the way it will look like, we will be using strided convolutions to shrink the dimension of the input into something small. Maybe we will pull, put a fully connected layer at the end. Basically, we will put one or maybe few, a few fully connected layers at the output to create a representation Z. Let's call Z which is phi alpha of x. Okay. And we are inputting x here. Okay. So essentially, we choose the dimensions of the layers in such a way that Okay. Idea is our own. So we are choosing the dimension in such a way that we are reducing the amount of data. Okay? Every line here indicates a layer. Let's be exactly. So it's, it's each line here is a layer. It's just, just a graphical review. Okay, so these are the different layers. And of course, depending on the problem, we can have a different, basically a different number, different configuration here. But the idea is always the same. We would like to reduce the amount of data. Okay? Now, this is, if this is an encoder, the decoder should be somehow a mirror image of this. We should basically take some low dimensional code and produce an image from it. Right? So basically the, end, the decoder, so this is an encoder, the decoder should be taking this Z and expanding it to an entire signal or image, is the, whatever is the domain on which we operate. Okay? And again, these are layers. We might put some fully connected layer. Here are maybe a few fully connected layers. And we are producing x here. And here comes z. And this x is psi beta z. And this is the decoder. Of course, we don't necessarily need to match exactly the same dimensions as we selected here, but a typical choice is indeed to make this architecture symmetric. It means that we follow the same dimensions here in reverse order. Okay? So now let's see how, how to formally do it. Obviously, if we have a fully connected layer here of some dimension, let's say n by n, here we can put a dimension n by n, right? So we just transpose the matrix. Now with the convolution, let's see how we exactly how we transpose this, uh, how we transpose the, the regular strided convolution layer into uh, into something that will build our decoder. Okay, question. Yes. On the first observation, as it seems from the picture above, from what you draw, so it seems like you when you squeeze the dimensions, so you sort of lose information. So. How can the function be full in terms of how can you generate all the data back if you just lose huge dimensions? It's not hat hat al kib al or the lo al. Okay, so well, so, so it's, it's not a one-to-one -one method, definitely. But suppose suppose I have uh, so suppose my instance space looks like uh, all the digits from a, a given font. Okay. So I have basically nine possible uh, nine possible values. So I have one degree of freedom that can assume oh, ten possible values, right, from, from zero to nine. Okay, and uh, I also have some shifts or maybe rotations as well of the same digit, right? So if I can somehow create a representation of what this digit is like, and doing the rotation and translation, which of course takes a huge amount of variability in the in the instance space, with just with just one dimension. I can encode perfectly the data in the interspace, okay? So, ah, so you see, by uh, uh, avoiding the redundant data of where the digit is or how it is right, right it? Yes. so you can actually squeeze, ah, you squeeze the dimension of space because you don't need a space, you just need the digit. Again, this is a very simple example. Maybe you do care about the exact orientation and about in the exact position, but, but maybe people. you don't care about some other, some other aspects. And this is the factor that you can get out of your information. So let's say you have a 600 DPI rendering rasterization of your font, which takes, I don't know, many hundreds of pixels by many hundreds of pixels. 
but eventually you can encode it by by just by just a single dimension, right? Yes. So this is a, a very significant compression. In practice, this is a little bit wishful thinking. You you do need more dimensions than that. But surprisingly, for example, if you want to encode uh, data like human faces, for example, you really need a very small vector, despite the huge de embedding dimension of the you know, facial image. Thank you. And again, it, of course, you can think of some data that uh, do not obey this heuristic. The Ockham razor is a heuristic, but it would be very hard to find some useful data that, uh, that do not uh, obey this kind of parsimonious representation. It might be very complicated, but usually it's something that comes from something tangible, something physical, uh, does have a smaller number of degrees of freedom than the limit. Okay. Yeah. I want to ask, uh, how can we increase the dimensionality of the decoder? Uh, I mean, is your planning is good enough? Or we have no, no, no. So we'll, we'll see exactly, so this is exactly what I would like to show you, you know, basically how to build a kind of a mirror of this uh, convolutional neural network. Okay, so I will remind you briefly how a convolutional neural network, how a convolutional layer, just a linear part of a convolutional layer looks like, mm -hmm. and then we'll see how basically how to mirrored and the exact mathematical formulation <coughs> will be an adjoint operation or the transpose. Okay? Yes. Uh, the technique that you described is very sensitive to the training set. It can be non-balanced. For your example of one to ten digits, one to nine digits, so I can put thousands of one and only one from two to nine and I'll get uh, worse encoder. Well, so, so certainly. So, so, so basically, but th this is true for the supervised training setting as yes. well, right? So, so we, our assumption that we made when we try to analyze uh, why and when uh, learning can work at all was an assumption that we sample IAD from some latent data distribution, right? Which means, by definition, that your training set is balanced. If it is not, then of course you can introduce as strong biases as, as you might imagine. Right? So, of course, you need somehow to, to ensure that your data are sampled sufficiently regularly from the underlying unknown data. So, I'm still as supervised, uh, sensitive to the data I'm working. Well, I mean, there are no miracles. If you it's just sample to the same, to the same region, small region of the space, you cannot expect to discover all the space that you never saw. Before. What, what I'm trying to understand is where is the unsupervised part? There are no labels. We are not trying. So you will be, you will be a label. So imagine that X, let's say X are uh, images. Okay? Okay. Let's say natural images of uh, indoor scenes. Okay? So you will not be able to, to uh, this learning will tell you zero information of what is the difference between a chair and a table. You don't have this information in any uh, part of the, of, the, of, the, of the training of the model, but you can still be able to, uh, you, still be able, you will still be able to model how chairs and tables uh, are distributed among, uh, among all, let's say, 256 by 256 images, and distinguish between chairs and random noise, for example, okay? Or maybe outdoor scene. So you will be able to model the distribution, and then one of the users would be to sample from this distribution. So give me an image of a new chair, or a new, basically, piece of furniture. You might be unable to tell that this is a chair, but you might be able to generate uh, new samples of instances that you have never observed. Okay? So basically, what I would like to, what I would like to show you is how to mirror the structure of, uh, of a convolutional neural network. So let's remind ourselves how a convolutional layer looks like. So basically, what we had, uh, we had uh, a question yesterday. Um, if you train a convolution and we can go to facial images, uh, after the training, we would expect that every point in the latent space, after the decoder, would, uh, would we get a facial image? Okay, so, so basically, okay, so, so the idea is that, indeed, as you are saying, if you did the training well, basically you can then throw the encoder and randomize some point in the, in the latent space, pass it through the decoder, and you will always get the uh, facial image. Okay? It's a generating model. It, it cannot generate anything that is not a facial image because it has never observed anything different. Right? Okay. Okay. 
composed is not just a manifold. Exactly. So, so this is a then it the goes from the manifold. So if it forms something that then in this case now you flow it on top of the manifold, and that is let's call it the face manifold, and anything from that face manifold, if you decode this, it's a face. Exactly. So so basically the idea is that if if you if your model is sufficiently accurate and your training set is sufficiently big, you will be able to model the, the distribution of that manifold from which the uh, training data came, and then you will be able to generate endpoints belonging to that manifold. Okay, so basically this is the idea of a generative model. Now, you can say that uh, you still don't know how exactly to randomize in Z, right? What is exactly the distribution of the points in Z? If you just train this thing, and basically I will, will, will address it by, by introducing what is called the variation of the pattern, even if you build this thing, and then you try to analyze what is exactly the distribution of, uh, uh, of phi x, right? You just empirically compute this distribution from a training data. You might end up with a very complicated distribution of the z's in the latent space. So now if you want to settle from the latent space, you should better settle from the distribution, right? But that might be very complicated. So we'll see how to, we'll see how to overcome, or overcome this. So we are, still, we are still with the basics of how to create this uh, generative model, but we still don't really know how to sample from it. Okay? So our next step will be how to sample from this generative model. Okay? So let's see, let's see uh, how we build the decoder, how we transpose the convolutional layer. So remember that in the convolutional layer we have a sequence. Let me denote this sequence by Xn. Xn has Xn was basically, or let's call it X, okay, this is the input sequence. It's actually a vector valued sequence because remember we have channels, feature maps. Let's say we have uh, x1 i until xm i. This is a vector. And now we have a sequence of such vectors. Let me index them by i in z. So think of i as time. So this is a, a vector valued time series. What's the m stand for? m is the number of channels in the Okay? m is the number of feature maps. And if you, if you prefer to work not with time series but with images, just replace i by a multi-index in z, in z squared or zn, uh, where n is the number of your spatial limit. Okay? Alex? Yes. Just to make clear, now we are talking on one sample that we actually sort of... Uh, it's not one sample, it's a sequence. It's a sample. So it's a, it's a, it, I'm thinking about one-dimensional convolutions. It's easier to write, but basically, of course, you can easily extend it to uh, Two-dimensional or n-dimensional convolution. Oh, so when you mean i is running over time, i is the time is the time index. So it's an infinite sequence from minus infinity of samples. Exactly. Okay. Each sample is a vector. Let's say RGB is the input, or uh, you have m different channels, m different feature maps, because you are in some intermediate hidden layer. But for RGB, you need like three layers. Well, you have three channels, right? Yes, RGB. Yeah. So m would be three. Okay, and i is the index of the pixel. Okay. Okay. Make sense? Yes. Okay, so this is the input. Now the output of the layer, let's denote it by y, is another sequence y i1 up until y n i. Again, i is the spatial or the time index. I'm thinking of it as time. You, if you want something multidimensional, just put a different power on this z, okay, and make it a vector. Uh, and we have n potentially different from m number of output channels. Okay? Now, we are going to compute y, yj, as the convolution, as the, as the convolution of wij with xi. Okay? Convolution, of course, uh, Basically, convolution runs on this index, right? Convolution is the operation. Let me write it explicitly. Uh, let me write it like this. Yj at index k is wij. Let's write the index here as p. Xi k. Okay. This is 
is how the conversion looks like explicitly. So basically what we are doing, of course, here we have a sum. Here we have a sum over i's going from 1 to n, and here we have a sum over i's going from 1 to n. So basically we are building a bank of filters, of n filters per every output channel. So we have an n by n filters, which basically I'm denoting by WIJ, and WIJ are the imp impulse responses of these filters using the signal processing terminology. So basically I'm convolving each of the channels of the input with the corresponding filter and summing over the channels of the input channels. And this produces a single output channel. Okay? And I'm doing this for every output channel. Okay? So this is a regular convolution. Of course, on top of this I'm putting some element-wise nonlinearity, maybe also a pooling operation. We'll, we'll talk about pooling in a second. Okay? So I'm, I'm not writing the nonlinearity. Of course, the nonlinearity also has a bias term. Right? Let's, let me ignore it. These are obvious things. Okay? I'm interested in, in this linear operation that defines the conversion. Now, what, is, what I'm also typically doing, I'm using strides. So I have this nice image here, which I don't remember from which website it is. When you say stride, you mean at least two steps. Well, right? so no. these, are, these are strides. So this is the regular conversion as I defined it. These are strides. So it yeah. means that I'm essentially subsampling. I'm subsampling for of this. So I'm taking every this sample and skipping everything in between. So basically, let me just define this operation. This is called uh, striding or subsampling. Error down with an integer d of a sequence x at point k means that I'm taking xk d. The xk d sample. So it's basically it's discrete, discrete subsampling of my sequence. And of course, if you if you are talking about images then this D might be a vector. You can take a different, different stride length in every dimension, but usually it will be the same stride length in every dimension. Okay? So this is basically what conditional we are done. Yes. Excuse me, but what does it mean that I is skipping? It means that basically, uh, the, let's say the tenth, let's say you have a stride of D equals 2, it means that the tenth output layer, the I in the sigma is skipping. Well, so essentially you are putting, okay, so let me write it explicitly here. We are going to put dk here. Okay? So it's the output of the convolution uh, in basically jumping in multiples of d. So if you, let's say you first compute the convolution and then you want the tenth output sample, it would be 10 d output sample. Okay, so if d equals uh, 2, it will be the 20th output sample. Okay? So this is, this is and again, you can see from this visualization for two-dimensional signals. So this is the regular convolution. You see that basically the window runs with basically uh, with an increment of two, or an increment of one, sorry. And here in the stride of convolution, the window runs with an increment of two. Okay? Partially increment of, yeah, increment of two. You see? Basically, you're skipping every old sample. Okay? So this is stride of convolution. Now let's see how to let me represent it differently. capital M 
over B samples in the output uh, sig uh, sequence, right? We stop something over B. So now I can write Y1 as W. Basically, I'm just writing uh, what is written here explicitly. Let me write it like this. It will be W1, 1, X1. So this is a top list matrix representing the convolution with filter W11. Uh, then I have W M1 XM, okay? And YN is WYN X1 plus WMN X. Okay? So basically, this is. This is the same, these are the same sums that are all there, written now in this matrix vector multiplication form. The only thing that is missing, of course, is this subsampling matrix, right? So the subsampling matrix will be a matrix with, let's say, D equals 2. It will, be, it will have twice more columns than rows. It will be an identity matrix from which we remove every second row, right? So this is basically a subsampling operation. Let's call it SD. And of course, if D is different than 2, then we'll have a different ratio between the number of columns and rows, right? So let's say S2 will look like this. It will be 1, 0, 0, 0, 0. Then we'll have 0, 0, 1, and so on. Okay, so it's identity matrix with removed rows. Okay? Now, let's try to invert this picture. So let's, uh, not to invert, to transpose this picture. So basically, we start with a sequence that have an n-dimensional input with a certain number of pixels or time samples, and we end up with an n-dimensional uh, vector value sequence with d times less uh, samples, right? Even though the sequences are infinite, still, which are basically d times lower density of the sample in the output. So let's now do the reverse. Let's try to do the reverse now. Okay? So basically, the formal mechanism for doing this is, is an adjoint operator. So what we have here is a linear operator, which can be represented by, by these, uh, basically, in this, in this case, in case of time signals, these are tensors of rank 3. We have basically two coordinates here plus one time coordinate here, right? So basically we have, uh, we have these, uh, these representations. Now let's try to transpose this linear operator. So just a reminder what, it, what, it, what we need a linear algebra by an adjoint. Adjoint is basically is, is the formal definition of uh, transpose. So let's say we have two spaces, x and y with appropriate inner properties defining them. Okay. And let's say we have two operators, one A mapping from X to Y, and another one B mapping from Y to X. Okay. Then if for every X from X and Y from Y, the following identity is satisfied, if we have A a operating on X gives us something in the space Y, right? So we, then we can compute an inner product with Y, inner product defined on Y, right? And if it happens that this is equal to X inner product with BY, this is an inner product on X, right? BY gives us something in the space X. Then we will say that B is the adjoint of A and denoted by A star. Okay? So this is the definition of, uh, of the adjoint operator. And you can think of a matrix, basically it would correspond to a transpose of a matrix, or a complex transpose, if the matrix has complex entity. Okay? So this is, this is the formal definition of an adjoint. Now, pay attention that despite the fact that the domain of the, uh, of the adjoint is the codomain of the operator A, so basically it maps backwards from Y to X, it's not an inverse of A. A might not be necessarily invertible, right? It's not an inverse. There, there is a very particular case of what is called unitary operators, whose adjoint is also with their inverse. But otherwise, the adjoint has nothing to do with an inverse. The inverse might not even exist. Okay? Because you squeeze dimensions. Here. For example, y might have a different number of dimensions than x. 
a microbial girl. Okay? But, it's but the joint always exists. It's like it's a semi invert or yeah. there is no uh, one. It's just a completely different operation. It's called the joint. All right. Okay, so it's like a transpose of a matrix. And basically what I would like to do, I would like to formally construct the joint of this operation. And in terms of again, so basically if A mapped from X to Y, B mapped from Y to X. So if we want to map basically backwards, the joint is exactly the operation we need here, right? So we want to basically to reverse the flow of this uh, of this neural network. So basically, we want the adjoint of this convolutional layer. So let's take the adjoint. Now, we, now let's, so let, let's define it. Let's define it in the following way. We'll call it transposed convolutional layer. The transposed convolutional layer. So I will use uh, I will use now y as the input and x as the output. Okay, just to stick to the same notation. So the input will be y, y of dimension of n dimensions, and the output is x. Okay, of course, we are not hoping, hoping to invert the action of, uh, of a strident convolution. So usually inverting the action of the convolution is called deconvolution. So in the literature, this, these transposed convolution layers are typically referred to as deconvolutional layers, which I think is a horrible name, because we are not doing deconvolution. We are not trying to invert the action of convolution. We are simply transposing it. So this is basically like confusing an inverse with an adjoint, which is, of course, is not. Okay, so let's not call them deconvolutional layers, we'll call them transposed convolutional layers. Okay? So in terms of dimensionality, they are exactly like inverses, but they are not inverses. It's usually impossible to invert the, the action of the strider convolution. Or like, like convolve something with a Gaussian filter. How can you how can you, you invert? Okay, so basically what we are going to do, we are going to transpose this. So first of all, Transposing these matrices is easy, right? We just put transpose on these matrices. Now the sum, we have to replace x's and, and y's, right? So basically, these two indices will also switch their, switch their, their position, right? So basically, what we are going to have is this. We are going to have x1 equals w11 transpose. Now, what is the transpose of the topless matrix? It's also topless, but what happened to the diagonals? They reverse forward, right? So basically, we have a mirrored impulse response. So mirrored in time or mirrored in space if we have a, we have a two dimensional image. So let me write it as W bar. And W bar will be, of course, convolution within the reverse field. Okay? Now, so this will be the transpose of W. Now, what happens to SB? As D will become as trans as D transposed. Okay? We'll see what what, what, it, what it means, right? But if S D was a matrix that was doing down sampling, now as D transpose will be doing up sampling, right? It takes small uh, uh, it, it takes a smaller number of uh, of the samples and gives you more samples, filling basically in between the zero, right? So this is an up sampling operation. This multiplies Y. 1 plus w 1 n y n, right? So you see, I promised I will invert these indices, right? Because the second index rise, uh, runs from 1 to n. Okay, so I inverted these indices. And x m will be w, well, of course, here I have s transpose b. W M one. Okay. So this is the transpose form of the convolutional layer. Just pay attention that this is really the formal joint. 
which are of course verified by the definition. And if I now write it in this form, so remember what we had before. We first had convolution and then down sampling. Now because transpose also reverses the order of the matrices under product, I first have up sampling and then convolution. Okay? So graphically you can see like this. So you first upsample your signal, filling basically with zeros everything in between, and then you do convolution with the mirrored filter. Okay? So this is the transpose convolution. Of course, it's not an inverse, it's a transpose. Okay? So let me write it in this form. Could you repeat where was the inner product? Pardon? What? What in the actual uh, formulas on the left is the inner product? Well, so we don't have an in so what is written here is a linear operator that takes y and gives you x. So this is b, right? Okay, so I have a unique actually to apply an inner product on these Hilbert spaces, basically of sequences, to show that uh, this formula is satisfied. That b that is defined there and A is, that is defined there, they are one, they are joint of that. So if you compute these inner products, you will see that this is satisfied for every sequence X and B. Okay? But basically, I, since I know that the joint corresponds to matrix transpose, and I wrote in the matrix representation, I just did it by, by transposing the matrices rather than going to the definition. Okay? So basically, if I write it this way, I will have X I, equals to the sum on j from 1 to n w reversed in time i j convolution see if you first need to upsample so I will upsample by d my signal y j okay and then do the convolution and this upsampling just as a notation this upsampling of y at point n, this or let's use the escape. It is y k over d if k is divisible by d and zero el elsewhere. Okay, so basically I'm taking my samples, I'm now putting them on a more and on a more densely sampled grid at every place every uh, integer multiple of d and filling the rest with z. Pardon? Can't you do something smarter than just to make that Well, you can, you can, so in signal processing, you, you are never satisfied with this operation, you usually put some uh, anti-aliasing filter. Usually, but here we, we just care about doing the transpose. So you Yeah, basically, so basically, well, what, what will happen then we will have many subsequent layers. So we, we really care about keeping the dimension. What will happen, of course, here I'm writing the same Ws in the convolution and the transpose convolution layers, but actually the encoder and the decoder are parameterized by two independent sets of parameters, so we don't necessarily need to keep exactly the same weights. Actually, we, we will never keep the same okay. So it's not exactly about the definition of the adjoint. If you, uh, well, so, so it will not be an adjoint anymore, but basically you start with an adjoint to have something that uh, basically reverses you the order of these dimensionality reduction steps, right? So you will have exactly the same dimensions in reverse order, and then of course you, you free these parameters to be learned uh, by solving, by minimizing that loss function that we wrote before. Yes? It's about the animations uh, back there. The left one is when we don't have a padding on the... Okay, so I, I, I would like to ignore padding because basically I'm, assu I'm assuming that I have infinite sequences. Of course, if, if you have boundary conditions, then you also have different ways to pad, to pad your signal this series. Or maybe to impose some second boundary conditions. Okay, but so padding is, is not, uh, not exactly important for this discussion, but it's important in describing. Okay. Now, one thing that is important here as well, and then we'll, we'll do the break. So, superficially, this might look like what we defined last week as uh, uh, dilated convolution, right? But this is not dilated convolution. So, just for visualization, 
this is the elated convolution. So you see, in the delayed so here, you delayed x and still kept w the same as before. In the delayed convolution, w is delayed. Okay, so basically, what we have here is w convolution with upsampled y. And in the later convolution, which is not the same, we have upsampled w convolved with y. Since this upsampling is not a shift invariant operation, they are not commutative, right? So it's not the same. This is the later convolution. And this is our transpose. Transposed uh, stride convolution. Okay. Again, an important difference. They have completely different meaning. Okay, so let's let's do the break, and after the break, we'll uh, we'll see how to construct the variation of them for their wide meaning. Now, there is one more thing that uh, probably is worthwhile mentioning. So typically, typically, at least, uh, at least nowadays, the typical the typical. Uh, structure of convolutional neural networks has uh, strided convolutions and quite rarely pooling. If you have pooling, like max pooling or, or average pooling, you can also create a transposed version of pooling, like what is typically known as unpooling in the literature. Uh, I will skip this because I'm a little bit short in time. You can see exactly the definition of these two kinds of unpooling in the, in the lecture notes. There is nothing extraordinarily difficult about it, completely straightforward. Uh, but yeah, again, I would like to skip and start talking about variation of open code. Okay. So the, the main the main disadvantage of this uh, of this structure, basically we would, we would like to be able to generate new instances. To generate new instances we need to train an encoder decoder pair minimizing the loss that I already uh, that I already removed from the board. Basically, we are minimizing this kind of a loss. Right? We are minimizing the norm of this difference. Let's say the L2 norm, or maybe if we have some other better similarity criterion, we can use the better similarity criterion here. It will be actually crucially important to the performance of the generating model. But once we train this, we can forget about the encoder and generate uh, points directly in the latent space. We generate, we draw a point from some distribution of the latent space, we pass it to the decoder, and we always get a point on the instance manifold, right? So for example, if we learn the generating model of faces, it will always be a face image. Then we can, can do some, uh, some arithmetics in this latent space, like I don't know, let's take averages. Of course, the result will not be an average in the instance space. It will be some kind of an intrinsic average in the manifold, which usually will come, uh, which it will usually will be much more meaningful than just doing a Euclidean average in this instance. So, so uh, the problem is that if I really want to now randomize to draw to draw a variable z from the latent space, I don't know which distribution to draw it from. Right? It's really the distribution of the distribution that the encoder created might be completely crazy. Okay. So basically, I would like to fix this problem. And basically, to this end, we can use the ideas of uh, uh, variation of Bayesian uh, inference, basically from statistical, from statistical learning, combined with, uh, uh, with deep learning. So basically, this. Uh, this combination leads to what is known as variational autoencoders or VAEs. Okay, so let's let's start first by rephrasing the entire problem of building a generative model in some probabilistic terms, and then we'll see where the encoder and the decoder architectures come uh, come into the play and how exactly. Okay, so let's see. Let's start with the probabilistic interpretation. So let's start with the with the generator, with the with the decoder. Okay, so we we'll start with the decoder. Now I have some 
So basically, I will be treating my x's and z's as random variables. I will write them using capital letters, and, and lowercase letters will be specific realizations of, that, of those random vectors. So I will have some z distributed according to some pz. Okay? This is the distribution on my latent space, and I will call in the Bayesian language this is called the prior distribution. This is the prior distribution. Now, uh, now I will have some some uh, sample, some instance x. It is also a random variable, but I, actually I can I can see how this distribution distribution if I condition it on z. So I think I have this conditional conditional variable that is distributed according to this to this distribution. Okay, so basically I'm giving you so I'm giving you a specific variable, a specific realization of the of the z. And still from that z you might in general generate some distribution of instance. Of course it can be just a delta and atom. Basically you have no randomness. But usually you would like to allow some randomness there. So basically, one, the same z might be mapped to slightly different instances. Okay? And I can, I can uh, so this is called in the Bayesian uh, language, this is called the likelihood. The likelihood of x given the conditioning variable z. Okay? And I can, I can model this, I can model this <coughs> as a normal distribution. Center that some uh, center that some psi beta x sorry psi beta z with some unit covariance sigma square. So essentially, I'm taking I'm taking a point z in my latent space and I'm mapping it to some to some distribution here. Okay. This is distribution of x given z. Okay? Yes? The model uh, that was shown for the uh, decoder was a completely deterministic. So yes, yes, of course. I'm, so I'm how do you model uh, the, I mean, how this is realized in the, in the system that you... Oh, sure. sure. I, I, will, I, will link it, I will link it to the system, uh, uh, basically, in the course of the next 15 minutes, something like that. But basically, our decoder is this. It will give me the expected value here. This is my expected value. This is my decoder for you. So I'm allowing some randomness around this expected value. And you will see that this, this sigma is some kind, kind of a hyperparameter. I fix it in my problem. You will see that it will give me some kind of a trade-off between the regression loss term and some regularity. So, okay, so we'll see that explicitly. But basically, it tells me how, how much I trust my, uh, my data term. Okay? or how much regularity I would like to, to inject into, into the training, okay? So sigma is some fixed parameter. I'm not going to do any adjustments to it. It is something that I will put by time, okay? So you see, basically, I'm generating, given, given, uh, given a specific realization of Z, I can generate, I can, I can generate instances from this Gaussian distribution. Usually sigma will be something small. Yes. All of this you do after training, or can you incorporate this in? in well, of course, I will do training, but suppose I have some parameters beta that uh, parameterize my, yeah. my generator, right? So for every beta, you have a different generator. Yes? I think I lost the flow of the subject. I, I will turn this off. Um, and I, I, I will go after his question. So where are we now in the big process of training? So, oh, so, we, no, no, so we are not. We are still not doing training. Suppose I train my model. So this is a probabilistic interpretation of the generator of the decoder. Okay. So I would like. I would like. Eventually, I would like to be able to draw something from the latent space Z. Okay. Yes. So I'm assuming some prior distribution. I will force it now to be some normal distribution. Mm -hmm. Okay. So once I have my Z with the prior distribution, I'm given Z, I'm creating an instance, basically a condition on Z, I'm drawing it from this distribution. So essentially, this randomness is just a technical tool to give something that has, that gives me continuous expression so I can, I can compute gradients, okay? Actually, I can put sigma to something very small. 
and you okay. need it before the training because you want well, to Well, during the training. This will yeah. also enter during the training. You will see that this will give me exactly that L2 loss term that they had in the L3 code. It's a sort of initializing some... Uh, no, no, it's not initializing. This will give the loss term. We'll, we'll see it in okay. okay. But again, I'm just trying to first to summarize the model, the, our assumption. So we basically, given, so the, 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 the role of the, of the decoder is very simple. Give me the Z, I will draw you some, some variable from the conditional distribution. That conditional distribution is trivial, right? It's trivial, it's simply a Gaussian centered at some mean. That mean is exactly all the complexity of the decoder, right? You see, this is the mean. This is a complicated transpose convolutional neural network. Ah, this is what we, yeah, exactly. we really don't want to deal with. Oh, well, I, I, I have to deal with this. This is, our, this is the, the heart of our model. Okay, so I will be training this. Okay. The rest is just a probabilistic interpretation. Okay, okay so, so, so <laughs> I got it. This, so, is my, this is my decoder. I'm using the same, the same notation. This is my decoder. So you want to understand what is the mean and what is uh, the, the variance uh, around well, it? Well, I'm fixing this. So the variance is fixed. To some, basically, I'm allowing some amount of randomness around the mean, and the mean is exactly so. So basically, I'm interpreting now my decoder as something that parameterizes my conditional distribution, my likelihood, right? Yeah. Okay. So if I know how to draw from this prior, I can immediately get a mean. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. But during the process, I guess you're going to do bias mean, right? So, uh, do you you are going to use bias mean something with yes, the yes of course I will use so the base rule to basically to get the yeah but you code. you already know this from the trainings right the, the m x to z well there will be some computation okay. we will see that we cannot we cannot compute p x we need to approximate yeah okay okay so so what so the next thing that I would like to do so basically if this map is complicated enough. Actually, just think of a one-dimensional case. By a, by a map complicated enough, I can take any distribution and map it to any other distribution. So take a distribution of your choice, let's say a normal distribution, pass it through its CDF, community distribution function, and you will get a uniform variable. Pass it through a, an inverse CDF of a target variable, you will, and you will get any target distribution you want. Right? Like simulation. Well, this is how a random numbers of any distribution can be generated. Yeah. And of course, the same applies to the, to the, to the multi-dimensional case, to the multivariate case. You just need to work with every dimension separately. So basically, what, uh, what it means that I can actually force here any distribution of my, uh, of, of my preference on the z-space. It will just amount to modifying this nonlinear map to generate my desired distribution of the, of the instance. So what I will do, I will, I will force this prior distribution to be normal, with zero mean and unique covariance. Okay? When you say force, you say I'm initiating it, uh, I'm initiating it, initiating it, or I'm converting it towards this. Well, well I, I, will, I, I will put some term into my loss function in order to obtain something that is close to mm. okay? But basically, why, why do I need this? Because I want to draw something from uh, a distribution that, that, is, it is, that is easy to draw. Because if you know it, so you can draw it with um, minimal uh, error. Well, because basically, I, I, so I don't want to draw from complicated distributions. I want to draw from, a, from, it can be a normal distribution, it can be a uniform distribution, whatever. Basically, for a normal distribution, I will have simple closed form expressions in the loss. That's why I mentioned it. Okay, so basically, this is this is the decoder part. Okay. So if I now draw an instance, uh, sorry, if I draw a latent variable from the prior distribution, which is normal, I pass it through this decoder, I get an instance coming from this uh, from this likelihood, right? From this conditional distribution. Okay. So in order to build an encoder. Basically, in order to build an encoder, I need to basically to use the base uh, uh, to use the base theorem. I essentially need this. I, I need to reverse the order of the conditioning. Right? I'm given x my instance, and I would like to to see how the corresponding latent variable is distributed. Right? Now, of course, this is given by the Bayesian theorem. 
Px given z times Pz over P. Right? This is big. Now Pz is my prior. Uh, this is uh, this is my likelihood, and this is in the Bayesian terminology. This is called the evidence. Px is called the evidence. Okay. Now of course I can say well. It's very easy. I can take Px and simply integrate over all Px given z times Pz. Let me write it like this: Pz this, right? This is usually known as the total probability form, right? But in practice, if you try to, so you cannot evaluate this in symbolic type of thing, right? So you need to approximate it from, from, from some sum, right? But Z is a very high, I mean, it's not a very high dimensional, it's not a very high dimensional space, but it is, uh, it is moderately high dimensional, so doing these high dimensional integrals is not easy. And then, also, you, 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 pro you probably need a huge sample of Z's in order to compute it accurately. So just imagine in, in the example of digits that I have. I might have a digit like this, or I might have a digit like this with some missing part here, or I might have a digit like this but shifted left. Okay. Now, if you look at how uh, how this likelihood uh, treats basically different uh, different different instances, so if you take uh, let's say the negative log likelihood here, it will just amount to the Euclidean distance between between the the two axes. Now, the Euclidean distance between these two instances is much bigger than the Euclidean distances between these two instances. Why? Well, because here you are missing just this small, this small portion. Oh, I And here we basically have, you have almost total lack of overlap between the two digits, mm -hmm. right? So it means that your data are really structured very intricately in the, in the, in the ambient Euclidean space. So you need a lot of examples to, to delimit the boundaries of this manifold. To be to be to be accurate, right? So basically, you need really a zillion of samples here to ac to accurately approximate this p x. Okay. Now instead of instead of uh, uh, directly estimating this p x and consequently this p z given x, so we can so in order to comp to compute p z given x uh, using the base formula, we need p x, and this is intractable. So what we are going to do, the next best thing we can do, we will approximate it by some <coughs> new probability measure Q. So this will approximate Pz given this. Okay? So we'll build a parametric family of distributions that will approximate our posterior. This is called the posterior probability in the Bayesian terminology. Yes? Why the maximum thing? Why the maximum thing? Not the maximum thing, but the R max of three to three. Well, this is for the entire system I talk, right? We would like to maximize the expectation of log uh, P, right? Yeah. This is, well, this is going to be our training book. But what I'm asking is why is a chauvinist if you tell me. Well, this is what the this is what the encoder does, right? You I, you are giving me x and I'm giving you z. Yeah. So I'm giving you x and this I'm telling you how z should be distributed, draw from the distribution. Yeah. Okay? And what has you done is this. Well, if you want to have to if you want to calculate this distribution, you need px. It appears in the denominator. Right? right? Well, there is so no maximum. Maximum value. If px is common for all those sets, then how is it? Well, but again, if you want to stay within the Bayesian framework, you must have this denominator Px because it depends on x. X is your input. Px will depend on x. If you just remove that function, you will get the wrong result. Right? Yes. I mean, you cannot just throw it away. Okay? I think, yes? I think what you said is something that you usually see when you see this. Well, you're probably thinking of some kind of a map estimation or maximum likelihood estimation where the denominator doesn't affect the result. Here, it does depend on the input. You cannot throw it. Okay? So it's not exactly the same thing. It means 
Well, again, you can... It depends what you put on, what you put, your conclusion of X, Y, Z, or whatever. It doesn't matter what kind of distribution it is going to be, it depends what you decided. Well, again, again, I, I'm, so I, what I'm trying to say is simply that if I could compute it if using the basic... And, it's yeah, it's exactly, so I, and I, I'm trying to convince you that because of this PX, and the denominator is intractable, okay? So I'm, I'm not going to try computing it by something, I'm going to try uh, approximating it by some parametric family of distribution, okay? And this will be my parametric family of distributions, Q, okay? I will, I will, uh, uh, basically, I will decide, this is a typical choice, basically, that my parametric family of distributions, Q, Z given some realization of X, will be, will be normal with some vector, some mean vector. Let me write it mu alpha. Alpha is, is a parametric function, is a neural network basically, that depends on x, and some sigma alpha that also depends on x. And basically these are two, these are basically outputs of an, of an encoder neural network, okay, parameterized by the parameters alpha. And usually, sigma is forced to be a diagonal image. So this is the covariant predictor is forced to be diagonal. And basically, these collectively we call them phi alpha in our previous trick, right? So basically, this will be my encoder. <coughs> it will take x and it will give me the parameters of my distribution q that approximates the posterior distribution p z condition by. Okay? Makes sense? Yes. Um, can you please walk us through um, uh, on uh, all the notation, all the notations on the board? So half part of them are assumptions and part of them are empirical uh, uh, results that we get. Okay, so the specific forms, like, read, like the form written here, the form written here, and the form written here, these are some modeling assumptions that I'm making. Basically, all the complexity goes into these maps psi beta and mu and sigma alpha, right? Basically, all the complexity, of, all the modeling complexity, all the capacity of representing the, the data goes into these two neural networks, right? These are two neural networks. The encoder and the decoder. My assumptions here, basically, I, I, I'm claiming that I can map any distribution to any distribution, so I'm asserting that the prior is, is normal. Okay, I I need some amount of randomness here, so I, I, I need it to concentrate around some mean vector. So the mean is the complicated part. The variance here is isotropic and has some hyperparameter sigma squared. Okay. Now I'm I'm saying that I'm unable to compute the posterior efficiently directly, so I'm going to replace this posterior by some parametric family of distributions that I'm calling Q, that I will force to be normal, okay? And what I'm going to do next, I'm going to demand, I will add a term to my loss function, I'm going to demand that this Q actually is actually close to the real posterior, okay? So again, I will be unable to compute the distance to the real posterior because of this Px and the denominator, but I'm going to drop it because I will convince you that, it, first of all, it is small, and second, it will, will give me a lower bound. Okay? So, so, so uh, anyway, I will get rid of this P because it's intractable. Uh, so basically, I, I'm left with, again, the, the, all the complexity of my model goes here and here. So I, I can recognize immediately my encoder and decoder neural network in this, uh, basically, in these maps, right? But uh, now I'm giving it a, a different interpretation. This is, a, this is a probabilistic interpretation. So what I'm going to do next, I'm going to build a loss function that I will minimize in order to, to train this system. Okay? Any questions? Yes. yes. Uh, how can you know that the, the summation of the distribution will be even close to this? Because Z can be highly... Uh, Redundant space. I mean, you you didn't enforce in any place that you enforce the descriptiveness 
the, the descriptiveness of that when you demanded that uh, uh, using phi and psi will, uh, will result in the identity, okay? So sure. that is descriptive. But that can be very sparse, so like hoping that you will just uh, throw the coin and, and fall on a point that has some uh, generative... Uh, well, but no, no, I'm, I'm, I'm not allowing Z to be of any such... Uh, yeah, but normal distribution... Is, is normal distribution really cannot really have really these concentrations uh, of measure that you are that you're, you're measuring. Right? It is nice and smooth and continuous. I mean, I, I, okay, maybe maybe I'll ask later. Okay. I don't know how can you book the. So, so, basically, so basically, the, the latent spaces are arbitrary. The latent spaces are arbitrary. I choose it. Nobody fixes it, uh, it upon me, right? So I can choose it in such a way that the latent variable is distributed normally in the latent space. Why not? Yeah, you can choose it. Of course, it will, it will result in different maps to and from the latent space. You, you, you can design it, but yeah. uh, this model uh, doesn't enforce it. Well, I, I, I will enforce it. Okay. Uh, of course, I, 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 I mean this is this is this is the goal. So let's. Uh, so what we are going to do next? We are going to we are going to enforce. So to, uh, one thing that I need to enforce, I would like to enforce that my uh, that my that my basically approximation of the posterior Q is close to the real posterior P. Okay, and and this can be done by taking a distance between two distributions and making it small. Okay, and what is the, what is the more or less canonical way of measuring distance between distributions? Uh, well, basically, it's, uh, it is called the Kubek library divergence, which is basically a way of measuring, of measuring uh, cross entropy between distributions. Okay. It's called the Kubek library divergence. It's a maximum likelihood estimator? Well, the maximum likelihood estimator asymptotically minimizes the Kubek level of the Okay? So it's, it's, it's not a distance, it's a divergence, it's not symmetric. Basically, the distance between uh, two distributions P and Q is not the same as the, the distance between Q and P. Okay? So, so basically, we will just define it as. Uh, let's, let's write it this way, the distance between Q and P, usually, but I mean, will be noted by D, distance between Q and P. Usually, basically, I will put, instead of, instead of a comma, I will write this double, uh, uh, this double line just to, just to emphasize that this is not, this is not a distance in, in the sense of a metric, it's not a metric. It can be symmetric, then it will become a metric, but this definition is not a metric. So it basically, it will amount to taking the expectation over z from q, expectation over z from q of, let me write it as log q over p. Or basically, uh, you can write it as log qz uh, minus log. Uh, minus log p. Let, let me write it as the difference of logarithms. Qz minus log p. Okay? This is the definition of the Kubek library divergence. And what we will do, we will take the Kubek library divergence between this p and this q. Okay? We have this distance between uh, between Q. Let, let's let me emphasize the dependence on alpha Q of z given x and p z given x. Okay. So basically, let, let me write it as uh, let me write it explicitly. Basically, it will be the expectation 
over z coming from q alpha of log q alpha z given x okay minus log let, let me write it directly using the base theory so I, I will substitute the log of this so it will be three terms right the, the sum of the two terms in the in the numer in the in the numerator minus the term in the denominator okay. so it will be minus log p x, x given z minus log p z and the log of x doesn't depend on z in the expectation, so I will put it outside the expectation. It will be plus log px. OK? This is the kubic ladder diversion. Now, uh, let's rearrange the terms. Let's rearrange the terms. So I can write it as, uh, let's put the log in the left hand side log px minus this cubic, the cubic ladder divergence between q and p okay equals so let's now rearrange we have uh, so basically, we have these these two differences of the logarithms is the kubic ladder divergence between q alpha z given x and p z, right? Basically, I'm taking these two terms, uh, and here I have. Sorry, it will be with the minus sign, right? We we reverse the sign with the minus sign plus the expectation of this stuff, right? The expectation of over z q alpha log px given z. Okay? Which px given z is exactly our our uh, likelihood, right? It's basically what we model in the decoder model. Okay. Now again, I cannot compute this thing because this term will eventually contain some px that is untractable, right? But you can say, first of all, the kubic ladder divergence is a non-negative quantity. If my my encoder is complex enough, I can basically build here a very complicated uh, a very complicated distribution that will match the distribution, the, the original posterior. So this term will be very small, OK? So what I'm going to do, I'm going to simply to drop it and replace this by n in the point. OK, so we, I, have, I, have, uh, I have a lower bound. I have a lower bound on, uh, on my log ps, OK? It's just a lower bound? Yes. And again, I'm saying that this lower bound is not terribly bad because this term anyway is going to be small. The P of S. Well, this could be better divergence between Q alpha and because mm. if Q alpha if, if is rich enough, I can get any distribution. Mm. Okay? I can get arbitrarily close to the to the to the posterior. Okay? So now we, now let's Make, so we need to make one technical assumption that our latent variables are point-wise. Basically, if we have a, a latent variable that uh, on which a certain instance depends, uh, another instance depends on another latent variable and not on that one. So basically, we don't have any global information that is shared between the latent variables of different instances. If we assume this, it's basically like assuming independence of the of the latent variables between, uh, between different instances. So we would like to maximize the product of Px. We want to find the parameters alpha and beta in such a way that, that our data, that the probability of the data that we are actually observing is high. 
so we want to maximize the product of p axes on the on the uh, on the training set, which can be written as minimizing minimizing the expectation of uh, minus log p x. Okay, and x on the training set. Okay, so ideally I would like to put an expectation here of the data. I have only an, uh, an access to the training set, so I can in practice only evaluate an empirical loss instead of this. Okay? So I would like to minimize this PX. Yes? You don't have the actual uh, big care that the uh, care that but if you have a lower bound. Sure. So, 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 well, so a lower bound on, on this divergence is zero. No, but you have the. Uh, so it's a lower bound on, on the log PX, right? Uh -huh. So if I try to make it, if I try to maximize the uh, expression on the right, I might get closer to the actual log PX. Right? Okay, so I, I will try to maximize the expectation of this, or this yes, expression, I, or expectation on X. And I know that if I do which is maximum value, it's, it's, it's a reasonable destination. Exactly. So I have degrees of freedom, the betas and the alpha, the beta and the alpha. So overall beta and alpha. Let me write it explicitly now. I'm going to maximize this expression or minimize its negative, its negative version. Okay. So since I'm, we are we are used to minimizing a loss, I will, I'm taking the negative log px, and basically we are going to minimize. We are going to minimize this expectation over x of what is written here. Basically, what is written here is log px. So this log px given z, let's write it explicitly. It's, I mean, it's negative log. Right? We are taking the minus sign. The negative log of that Gaussian distribution that we have here, let it, let's write it explicitly. It's 1 over twice sigma squared, right? I'm just copying it from there. Psi beta z, right? It's psi beta of oh, I didn't write, I didn't write. So it's expectation over x. Then I have expectation over z drawn from q alpha, okay? It's psi beta z minus, uh, minus z, right? So this guy evaluating it on z. So, sorry, minus, of course, minus, minus x, of course, uh, L2 squared, right? This is this term, okay? Plus a K, a, the KL divergence between two normal distributions, right? So I have this normal distribution, let me write it explicitly, mu alpha x. And again, this is everything is under the expectation on x, right? It's mu alpha x sigma alpha x. And the normal distribution with zero mean and unit covariance. Okay? And actually, there is a closed form expression for the second. And you will make the Tamakhtelashal exponent to build the algorithm. Where is that? You did oh, so there is also a constant that has basically the normal normalization factor of the Gaussian distribution that it's constant, right? So basically, it doesn't depend on our time base. And I, I'm going to minimize this. I'm going to minimize this with respect to our time base. And now you can see why I, I chose the uh, why I chose the uh, normal distribution because fortunately the Kubek ladder divergence for normal distribution has a simple closed form. I will write it specifically for this case. Okay. So what I'm going to have here is going to be basically this Kubek lever divergence. Let me write it just D, right? It's the only divergence that is left anymore. Uh, so it will be given by the trace of sigma alpha x plus uh, it will be one half, one half 
So it's trace plus the square delta norm of mu of x. Uh, minus minus k. K is the dimension. K is the dimension of the latent space. It, again, it's a constant. It doesn't change our loss function. Minus log determinant sigma alpha x. And again, determinant. Since we are now, you see why I'm forcing sigma to be to be. Uh, uh, to be a diagonal matrix because it's easy to compute these traces and, and determinants. Of course, I can do it with a full matrix as well, uh, but basically this is much easier. So this is th these are typical expressions that you get for cubic library divergences between uh, between uh, normal distributions. You can think of it as a regularization that we are adding to the loss function. You see, we have basically some L2 term that looks exactly as what we have with uh, when we train the encoder, the autoencoder in the a regular deterministic setting, right? And then we have this regularization. This sigma essentially governs the trade-off between between the regression term and the regularization term. The the smaller is sigma, the smaller is sigma, the bigger is this term relatively to the regularization, right? Basically the less regularity you want, the more you trust your data, the more the more you want this uh, term to be small. Okay? The more randomness you allow in your in your generator, the more regularity uh, it translates into in the in the loss function. Okay, so I could I could have just told you put this regularity and that's all, but I wanted to show some principle construction. Why why, why basically why why could it? Okay, so basically this is so this is the second term. Now the the first term is trickier. This term is trickier. So first of all, we have this expectation. We have the expectation over x. We have the expectation over z. We can, of course, do sampling. Like all these Bayesian approaches, they do sampling. And then, then we minimize this loss. But if we use stochastic gradient descent, we already do the sampling, right? If I want to put gradient of this with respect to alpha and beta, the gradient can go under the expectation, because the expectation is the linear operator, right? So it will be the expectation <coughs> of the gradient. And then when we do stochastic gradient descent, we do basically we we do draw samples randomly, either sample by sample or in mini batches from the training set, right? So basically we are computing empirical averages that are known to converge to basically to the expected value of the gradient. Uh, so we can just take this expression, right? And sample from x and from z. Basically z from, from q q up. Now the problem is that if you sample from Q alpha, this operation of sampling from Q alpha depends on alpha, right? So basically, if you think of this as a layer in a neural network, you have some stochastic, you have, basically, the network has stochastic inputs, but it also has some stochastic units, some stochastic operation inside the network, right? That does the sampling of Z from Q alpha. And you cannot backpropagate gradients, at least not trivially, through stochastic operations in the neural network. It's, no, it's not a continuous operation, it doesn't have a gradient. So basically what's, what is typically done in this case, it's, it is called a, a reparameterization trick. Instead of, drawing, instead of drawing z from this normal distribution mu alpha x and sigma alpha x, and this is a stochastic quantity depending on alpha, right, so you need to take gradients of this with respect to alpha. It's not, we don't really know how to do it. What we are going to do, I'm going to draw u from the normal distribution, and then define z by the following deterministic transformation. So the deterministic transformation will be mu alpha x plus the square root of sigma times u. Okay? So this is the deterministic transformation that is distributed exactly in this way, right? But now it's a deterministic transformation. U is a stochastic input. Now, we, of course, can deal with stochastic inputs using stochastic gradient, right? So we don't have any stochastic operations through which we need to backpropagate errors anymore. And basically, this is how we are going to operate. We are going to draw randomly either a single sample or a mini batch of samples from the training set of axes. We are going to draw random noise from the uniform distribution, U. We are going to transform it using this deterministic transformation uh, into z corresponding zi's, right? 
and we are going to use this to evaluate the loss. So it will be the L2 term plus that regularization term. Okay. Okay. On that, we will back propagate the gradient. Of course, the back propagation involves these complicated neural networks, right? Which is these and this one as well, right? We will do a regular back propagation that we know how to do, and we get a gradient. Uh, we get a gradient on the mini, mini batch that allows us to update our certain bets. Okay. And we do reiterate until we come back. Yes. Could you repeat when you just started the explanation about uh, the motivation on finding the distribution? Sure, yes. sure. So, so basically, if you want to compute this expectation over Z drawn from QA, QA is not a fixed distribution. QA, Q, sorry, Q alpha. Q alpha depends on alpha. So if you wanted to compute the gradient of this entire thing, of this entire expected loss, with respect to alpha, how can you do it? How do, do we know how to back propagate, how to compute gradients of a stochastic quantity? So z is drawn from a distribution that depends on our optimization variable, right? So I don't want anything stochastic to depend on our optimization variable. So I'm going to fix a stochastic quantity. Basically, I have a stochastic input. That is fine. But I don't want any operations through which I need to do back propagation that are stochastic. Okay? So instead of drawing z from this distribution, that would be a stochastic operation. I'm going to draw u from a fixed, basically parameter in the n mm -hmm. distribution. And then I'm going to apply a deterministic transformation to this u that depends on alpha. So you add another input to the system? And yeah, you you exactly. You re uh, material. Exactly. exactly. Okay. Okay. Makes sense? Okay, so, well, I will show you GAMS generic adversarial networks, I guess, next week. Just the way we But just, just, uh, just the idea, so we, we are not done with generating models yet. So basically, if you, if you look at this uh, L2, L2 loss term, the L2 loss has a, a, has a very nasty property that is called a regression to the mean. Uh, basically, when we minimize L2, for example, in case of images, we are quite liable to get uh, blurry images, basically, that tend to look like some kind of an average image. And uh, this is not good for, for generative models. We want the images to be crisp, to look sharp, like, like they do look in the, in the real data. So what we are going to do, instead of using this loss function, we are going to build the following the following system. So just let's just take the end, the decoder part, the generator part. We are going to build the generator uh, and couple it with a with a discriminative network, basically a network that takes an image or basically an instance that uh, we can either take from the data, from the real data, or from the generative model. And the network will output a probability whether this is a true data instance or something generated by, by the generator. So it will try to, try to reveal this counterfeit uh, that the generator is doing. So basically the generator, think of uh, uh, the generator is some very sophisticated money forger and we, we are forensic experts and we try to, to distinguish between real money and fake money. Okay? And basically we are going to train the, the given a generator, we are going to train the discriminator in such a way that it does this classification in the best possible way, okay? So think of it as a two-player game, as a min-max game. So we are training the, the discriminator given the generator to, to distinguish this forgery uh, from the real data in the best possible way. And once you fix the, the, the discriminator, we will train the generator to do the forgery as best as, as he can. Okay, and we will basically solve this min max problem. You can think of it as basically modifying the loss instead of using the L2 loss, modifying the loss as we proceed with the optimization. Okay? So this is called uh, adversarial training. It can be, of course, used in combination with variational autoencoders or any other generative model. We'll see next. Okay. 